All right, I think we're live. Hey everyone, welcome to Victory Condition Gaming. My name is Doug. Joining me tonight is someone that uh, I'm very excited to have on. Some someone that works with a uh, company that I'm I'm a huge fan of all their projects. Uh, who I've wanted to have on this channel for for a little while now, and I'm glad that I'm finally getting the opportunity uh, tonight. I'm joined by uh, Th Thomas from uh, Free League Publishing, also known as Free League. Again, uh, sorry, uh, Free League is uh, is how you're known in the states here, of course. Um, yeah, and, and I want to thank you first of all for, for joining me. I know it's uh, much later there than it is here, so I appreciate you staying up late and uh, and ta talking with with uh, with me for a little while about uh, your latest project. Uh, Thomas, thanks uh, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, thank you for having me. It's uh, it's a pleasure. Yeah, very cool. Um, do you want to uh, let's uh, right now? You have a, a Kickstarter on uh, a campaign going. It's got uh, three or four days left. It's Forbidden Lands. If anybody is interested in that Kickstarter, uh, I'm going to tell you to check out the description of this video. It has the link for the Kickstarter. Uh, there's still a little bit of time left, so please uh, check it out. They've got uh, you've got what one more stretch goal that's announced that you're kind of shooting towards. Um, hopefully, that should be unlocked here shortly. And then I, I, I don't want to speak for you, but hopefully, maybe there's there's a few more in the works. Uh, yeah, yeah, we have some ideas. Yeah, okay. if uh, it seems uh, like we might need a few more, and we do have some some ideas up our sleeves, so we'll uh, we'll announce those uh, when we get there. Okay, yeah. excellent, excellent. Um, the other thing, let's. Uh, I, I will mention that if anybody has any questions for uh, during the session, uh, please put them in the comments and in the chat, and uh, we'll get them answered it towards the end of the of the session, uh, or we'll just try to fill them in as, as we have time. Um, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about Freel again, and and uh, let's talk. I think you guys are probably one of the major forces behind this whole Swedish RPG craze that's taken the industry by storm over the last couple of years. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, how you all got started and and how uh, and how uh, things have have gone over these last couple of years? Sure. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh. It, yeah. It's quite interesting. This. Uh... I don't know Scandinavian or Swedish invasion that's been sort of uh, talked about recently. Yeah, it's 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 a fun thing. It's uh, I mean Sweden has uh, had a strong uh, RPG tradition for a very long time since like the eighties basically. There was a, there was a strong tradition there, so there is no real surprise. It's oh, we've been playing a lot of RPGs throughout the years. I mean it's a small country, but I do think like per capita it's probably one of the highest percentage of role pay players in the world most likely sure. and that's sort of been that way ever since uh so what's happened recently i think is uh a combination of different things that we've been always been making rpgs here uh but in the last four or five years maybe there has been a bit of a renaissance it's been and that's thanks to things like well actually kickstarter and a lot of other mm -hmm. things that's made it possible to actually make games that are a bit more polished and that that have a bit sort of a, uh, there's a bit yeah we've been, we've been able to make a bit more um yeah games that we couldn't have made 10 years ago just because it would have been too much of a financial risk but thanks to <laughs> kickstarter we can sort of make these kinds of games and uh, i i don't want to take all the credit but we free league and some other publishers started actually um translating some of our games and publish them in english and that our first game in English was Mutant Year Zero that came out in 2014. And that was at least if it, I wouldn't say that started it, but that was part of the start of this kind of wave. And since then, there's been not only from us, but from other Swedish publishers as well, some some quite nice games that have been doing quite well uh, internationally. Yes, oh, absolutely. Um, Mutant Year Zero is is the game that uh, that I first, that's how I found you guys. And it is just a great, if anybody is into they love like post-apocalyptic games. They like you know games that are, are sci-fi. That is the game to go with. I mean, it's just a great uh, it, it's a great system, and and it's it's just so much fun. It's so much fun to play. I can't stress that enough. And I have wanted to, to feature it on this channel a little bit more, and and hopefully I will eventually find time to, to do that. Um, so so you start with with Mutant Year Zero. And then you had a follow-up uh, expansion, or it's like it's kind of like an expand. I have a friend that calls it an expand alone. You can play it by itself, but it also yeah. adds to Mutant Year Zero, uh, called Gen Lab Alpha. Yeah, that was your second game here in the states. Um, right. 
that that where you get to play in in Mutant Year Zero, you play as mutants in in the poke, in this poke, post apocalyptic world. As in Gen Lab Alpha, you play as uh, these mute or like these anthrom uh, anthropomorphic uh, animals, sort right. of. Right. Yeah. And uh, that's again, it's another great game, and it's just oh my gosh, you guys are doing so much great stuff. I I love all this stuff. Um, <laughs> Thank you. It, it, it's just so much fun. And then, so those were the first two games that came over here. And then you kind of switch gears and you take this this engine, which I love. It works so great. And you tweak it for all these different settings. And the next setting that you put out was Coriolis. Yeah. Which is a, a sci-fi setting. And it feels like a totally different game, but it's the same kind of system. And it's it's so great. Do you want to talk a little bit about Coriolis while, while I've got you on? It's Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it's uh, it's a very different setting, but it, we've uh, actually we worked on the Swedish version of Coriolis for for a long time. Uh, we there was actually a previous version of of Coriolis that came out like I don't know ten years ago okay. with a completely different system, and we sort of inherited that game. And uh, we realized we wanted to make a new version out of it. And and by then, we had already published Mutant Year Zero. And we toyed around with a lot of different systems and ideas for game systems for Coriolis, because that's... But in the end, after having tried, I don't know, three or four different game systems and having play tested it for... And we, we, ne we never really uh, felt we, f we landed in the right place. And then eventually, we just said, well, let's try the Mutant Year Zero system and just sort of tweak it and see how that goes. And mm -hmm. we were pretty happy with it. And, and after that, we sort of, yeah, we just went with that. And, and it's, uh, it's been working quite well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a beautiful game. And it's just, it's, it's so much fun to play. Um, it does, and it captures a great, uh, for those of those that haven't checked out the Coriolis or haven't played it, it's, it's a sci-fi game that, uh, it's kind of like if Firefly meets Arabian Nights, it's, yeah. it's a great setting and it's so rich and it's just, just a lot of fun. If, if you're a fan of, you know, space and sci-fi and exploration and all that you should definitely give uh, Coriolis, Cor Coriolis a, a look at. And then you came out. You took Simon Stallenhag's uh, art, and you made an RPG about it. And yeah. I'm a big, I, I, of course, I'm, I'm like a ton of other people love Simon's work. Simon's just this brilliant uh, artist, and and uh, you made Tales from the Loop. It, and it, at the time when '80s nostalgia is probably at its highest, when you know Stranger Things is out, and people love that show. You made this game and it just took fire. Yeah. Like, did you have any idea that that was going to happen? <sighs> no, I don't know. It's not like that. We didn't expect that for sure. But I mean, we did know that. I mean, Simon's work is amazing. I mean, we yeah, that's right. we published uh, the art book with him, uh, also called Taste from the Loop, back also right. in 2014, uh, and. Even before that, of course, his work had been making the rounds and was known on the internet because he sort of just started publishing his work uh, online. And and uh, we contacted him and and started discussing making a book out of it, an art yeah, book. And nice. we did that. And then we did the follow up book called Thing uh, Things from the Flood, Flood, which is like the sequel. And we since we make RPGs and his work has been influenced by RPGs, even though he's not. Uh, and role player himself, but he's sort of his older brother was, and is really into that kind of uh, world. And we always said, we, this has to be an RPG. We really have to make an RPG out of this. Mm. And eventually, we kind of did. And and we, I can't say we knew it would take off like that. We got lucky a little bit because, I mean, obviously, <laughs> this <laughs> with Stranger Things because that we didn't know about that because when we started working on the game, that was before Stranger Things came out. But those two things kind of happened at the same time, and yeah. I think that helped. And then. It just took off, and it's yeah, it's been really fantastic. And you know the Ennies, and it's just been amazing. You won, you won five gold Ennies for it uh, this at this year yeah. at the Gen Con. That's that's a huge achievement. Like that's that crazy. Was yeah, that was crazy, completely crazy, and we, we felt so bad that we weren't there. I mean, we did want to go this year, but 
for practical reasons, it just right. didn't work out uh, to go there this year. But really, in hindsight, we really should have. So we had our uh, we we co-published uh, the game with Modifius, who were sort right. of handling our international distribution. And uh, Chris from Modifius was there, and he sort of uh, accepted the awards on our behalf. And that was he, he did a good job. But we really felt like we I watched it on YouTube and was like we should have been there. That was you know uh, really yeah, we should that, have been there. That was a yeah. huge huge moment for you. And, and yeah. They, I woke up the next morning and saw that you won all these awards. I was like, oh my word, yay! You know, I was, I was so excited <laughs> yeah. for you guys. Yeah, thank you. Um, that was fun. That, uh, yeah, that it's it's just crazy how that all kind of just fit together, and, and it's just it's a, it's a lot of fun. That's another game that's just a lot of fun to play. In fact, we have a store up north that has an ongoing group that plays Sundays and they play cool. Tales from the Loop and they love it. They just, and they, they keep on, they're about an hour and 20 minutes away from me. It's a, mm -hmm. it's quite a drive. So they keep saying, Doug, come on up. We got to come up some Sunday and play. Yeah. You can be like a guest role in the, uh, you know, a guest player in, in, in our session some Sunday. And I, I've got to go up to, uh, up to their store cause they, they just have a, a blast with it. Great. Yeah. So after Tales from after Red Tales from the Loop RPG, you went back and you hit you went back to Mutant Year Zero, and yeah. you put out a the robot version of the game, yeah, called Mechatron, and that uh, was uh, very well funded and took right off again. And you, you have you had Simon do the cover art for for that game. Which yep. is behind you right there, uh, I, and I love it. And if, yeah. if I had more money, I would have I would have bought one of those as well for my wall. <laughs> yeah, if, no, if they're nice. Up, if it were up to me, my whole all, every single room would have uh, Simon's work in it. But uh, unfortunately, my wife probably wouldn't uh, wouldn't like that oh, yeah. too much. But yeah, that. um, so that uh, I've already read the the alpha rules for, and and I love it. It's it's going to be so much fun. It adds a whole other layer to Mutant Year Zero. Uh, how is the finished work for that coming along? It's it hasn't hasn't hit print yet, but it's it's in the works. Yeah, yeah, it's bit, it's a little bit delayed, unfortunately, and that's because uh, it was supposed to be uh, shipped to backers around now. Uh, but it's it's uh, it's a little bit delayed. Uh, it's going to be a couple of months. We hope to get it out before the end of the year. And the reason for that is that we sort of got some feedback because it was published in Swedish uh, last year. And we got some feedback on the campaign part, not the rules and the setting, but the, there was a campaign uh, mm -hmm. in there as well. And, and there was some feedback on that. And we also did some thinking on, on our part and just felt that it needed a bit more work. It's it's we like that it's it's a nice core. The basis of it is good, but we just felt it needed a bit more. Uh, we wanted to break up the structure a little bit, make it a bit more modular, and that required us to to do some more work on it. Also, some more maps, some more art, and some other things. And we felt that to make it the way we really wanted it to, and we get the chance as we got that feedback from the the first the Swedish edition, we really could make the English edition uh, even better. So we just wanted sure. felt that we wanted to do that so we uh, that we're working on that right now to just finish those changes it's not that much but there is a couple of things so it's going to mean a bit of a delay but hopefully not too much yeah and folks want you know if you want a, a well polished products people are usually understanding of that and they'll they'll take you know they'll take that in stride and, and realize that they'd rather have a really solid game than in and wait yeah. a few months than than uh, you know something that's not less than a little bit less than polished and, and released yeah. early it always feels a bit sort of a bit weird to do that and then also have a new Kickstarter at the same time. But we sort of, we just put it out there and just were completely open with that. And, and yeah, there, it's been very, I mean, backers have been really understanding. So that's, that's, uh, it's been all good. Well, I think your track record on, on Kickstarter is very, very good. And, and, and you do a great job. You do great. Uh, you're really, you do a great job with communication. You do a great job. You know, uh, I haven't been disappointed with any, uh, project that you guys have done, um, so I, I, I think that that uh, says a lot, and, and I think most people are understanding because of the fact that you have such a great track record on there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's that feels good. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Forbidden Lands. That's why you're on. Sure. Let's let's talk a little bit about that now. You've yeah. uh, I heard that you guys were doing. I don't know where I heard it. I, I, you guys kind of snuck snuck this up on me, and 
I try to keep my ear to, to all things free league and and someone made a comment that, uh, on I can't remember what post it was but they made a comment that free league is working on a fantasy based RPG that uses the mutant year zero engine or that type of and I was just so excited, and I couldn't wait. And then you guys started putting this, like, teaser art on your Facebook page, and I'm like, oh, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And then finally it <laughs> launched on on, uh, on the Facebook, I mean, on, on Kickstarter. And I got to tell you, I'm, I'm not disappointed with this project at all. I am so excited for this. This is just let's, – let's dive right into Forbidden Lands. Um, let's uh, – you want to give folks a dis, uh, description of what Forbidden Lands is? Sure. I mean, it's uh, what we're trying to do here is sort of mix the old with the new. It's got a kind of a retro feel to it. Uh, and it, that's partly just sort of the visuals and the aesthetics of it. I mean, the art and so on has a retro feel. Uh, but also, we wanted to recapture something that's a way of, of playing that at least we did back in the day. I'm not, and that was sort of a more open uh, attitude towards adventuring that you sort of could go wherever you wanted. You you made up the world as you went along a little bit and it wasn't, you didn't have those massive narratives pre-made for you, but you sort mm -hmm. of made those up as you went along. And this is something that we sort of wanted to recapture, but uh, we didn't just want to make a game that was like, like when we played 30 years ago, we wanted to make something that all that was also new, and that's where we felt that at least part of the your zero way of playing really lent itself to that to to sort of use that kind of uh, mechanics, but in a fantasy setting and bring that uh, together with a sort of old school feel type of fantasy uh, art and world. And uh, it's really been a game that we've been, uh, I mean, doing a fantasy game, we, we before we made a post-apocalyptic po post game, we made uh, the sci-fi game Coriolis, and then we made uh, the Tales from the Loop, and we all felt like we really want to make a, a fantasy game. I mean, that's sort of, I don't know, it's it's something, it's like you have to go there sooner or later. We And, and we've been talking about this for for years really and and now it's like the time we really felt it's coming together so it's a lot of it's a lot of fun and we're all i mean everyone in free league we all have our pet projects like this project is more like my and then another one might be another person's favorite thing but this mm -hmm. is really mm -hmm. the one that everyone is coming together around and we're all equally passionate about it which is sometimes leads to some heated discussions <laughs> but that's that's all good no, that's great. Yeah. It's, uh, it looks like it's going to be such a great, uh, great project and such a huge, huge hit. Um, now, Simon, of course, did the cover. Is this is this going to be the thing? Is Simon going to do mostly covers now for your for your RPG books? Yeah, it's, it's, that's sort of become the the way we have done things recently. I'm, I mean, hopefully we can he can do more as well. But the thing with Simon is that he's focusing mainly on his own stuff, and he's he's now sure. working on. His, uh, we're just finishing his third art book, The Electric State, yeah. that we also did a Kickstarter for, and that's coming out pretty soon. And after that, he's already moving into his next project. And he's he's an artist, and he's really focusing on his visions and his ideas, which is great. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we do commission some art from him to do other stuff, like the Forbidden Lands cover and so on. But his main focus is on his own stuff. So that's why it's uh, we're mainly keeping it to cover art for the other sure. things. Yeah, that's all right. I'm, I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining. I, <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm, I was just wondering if that was going to be the case, and, and if so, that's I think it's a great move because it's, you know, it covers the first thing that grabs people's attention, and who better than yeah. you know, Simon to do that for you? Yeah. Um. So, with with this project, um, you are working with, uh, and I'm gonna. I hope I don't butcher anybody's name. N Niles is it Niles Gilson? Gilson? Uh, yeah, Niles Niles Gilson. Yeah, Niles yeah. Gilson. Yes. Um, and he's he's been he, he did a lot of fantasy art in the '80s, and and I love yeah. his you know I, I love his like gritty art, you know, fantasy style. How did you how did you get to start that relationship with with Niles? Yeah, that's a really fun thing. I mean, it's for for us, I mean, for most Swedish role players, he, Galixan's work is like what defined how like fantasy stuff looked in the first place, like the way an orc looked. That sort of mm -hmm, my mm -hmm. internal image has been his work from like '84 or something, because there wasn't that much fantasy art around at that time. There was no internet. There was no. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. so that was really who defined these kinds of things. And I still kind of, I mean, his style is, uh, I mean, now looking at it now, it has a really retro feel to it. Back then it was just, you know, 
art. That's the way but, it is. But, sure. but it, it, now I think it's sort of it's um it's we we we've just felt it's a nice thing. I mean, we do want to sort of get that kind of a uh, old school feel, and also uh, I mean, we have done other games, and there's a lot of great games out there, fantasy games that have like this kind of. Uh, polished color art that's sort of more of a concept art style and we just felt that's all good but it's we want to do something a little bit different so we felt it was nice for this project to go back to something a bit more like this kind of gritty line art uh, style that he, that he does so we we talked to him about this and we actually made an art book with him Yep. Uh, last year for, for his old uh, art and this was sort of a continuation of that project really that we felt that it would be like so cool I mean it's it's for me personally it's also a bit like you know doing a project with an old childhood hero so it's sure, sort of, absolutely. there is that to it as well but we also think it really works for the project yeah no it's it's great it's it kind of gives it it's, like you said it kind of gives its own feel and own look and and that's what you kind of want you don't want to be like everybody else you want to have something exactly. new and fresh and, and even yeah. though it's it's retro kind of in a way but it's it's fresh uh, as far as uh, what everybody else has going on so this that's great yeah. I, I, I again it's another great choice you guys just like I said you guys are doing some great stuff I love it <laughs> I love it Thank um, you. it's this and then you have a, a very well known and acclaimed writer working with you on this on this project um it's uh eric granston Grans yeah 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 he's um, also uh, one of like, like the heroes from the 80s we don't only work with those people but from the like the but but for this project it made sense sure. and uh, so we, we do have some new new forces as well but but we really do for this project we also wanted to bring a, on like the old guard and uh he was uh, one of the main like the most well-known rpg writers in sweden in the 80s and after that he's been uh he, he, his turn into full-time authoring and he's been he's written this it's a huge fantasy uh, series it's four books that all in all like i don't know two thousand pages or something it's it's mm -hmm. uh, it's huge he's built this whole world and uh, we worked with him. He actually made uh, our first RPG that's only been published in Swedish. is is based on his books. So we already had a, a, a partnership with him. And for this project, we wanted to bring him on because he's you know we don't want to bring on someone with some real solid writing skills and who can really bring like breathe life into this world. And uh, he felt like just a perfect uh, fit for, to do that. That's no, great. It's great. Is there any? Uh, now you said you you you've, your your first game was was his as an RPG based in his based on his books. So yeah. any, are there any plans to bring that to the English market? Maybe, or? Actually, uh, I don't know if it's online right now, but there was a, we made a translated a quick start. It's like okay. the condensed rules and a scenario for that world. Uh, it's uh, I should probably get that up online if it's not right now. I'm not sure. It's kind of nice. It's it has uh, that world is is sort of a bit. I mean, Forbidden Lands has is is quite. I mean, it's a new take on on classic fantasy, but it's still that kind of classic fantasy. But whereas uh, Eric's books are based in something called Trecoria. It's an island kingdom. It's sort of a mashup between like Renaissance Italy fantasy stuff and like Babylon. So it's a it's a bit more out there. It's not like okay. it's it's a bit, so, so it's, but it's still it's, it's a lot of fun and and uh, it's it's quite it's a deep rich setting that sort of you really have to dig into but it's possible that we might make something in english like more that's at some point later on we'll we'll okay. just be right yeah. now the focus is forbidden lands but sure. you know you never know yeah, yeah just you know um now this uh, this forbidden lands let's talk a little bit about the, the project itself it's it's a box set which is not something that you know, Mutant Year Zero and, and all the other games, they, they were all, you know, pretty much just books. Yeah. This is a, a two-book box set. Uh, it's going to come with the maps and stickers and, and all this. What what was the reason for the change in the in this in this this going about it this way in retail instead of just, just books? Yeah, I mean, we've done boxes before uh, if for the Swedish editions, right. but we haven't done it for the English editions, and that's for like practical reasons basically because of distribution is a bit more complicated and so on and and box sets are a bit more tricky that way but mm -hmm. for this project 
we decided to go with a box set uh, as for, for Forbidden Lands. And the main reason is that the map, the, the map of the world is really a centerpiece of the game. Right. And we just felt that we, to bring that, I mean, we wanted to make it a, a nice set and also that like the, the stickers we have for the legacy uh, feature, we just felt that a boxed set would sort of encapsulate what we wanted to do with this game to get like that kind of a feel to it and, and to have it, all the components in there. So yeah, we'll see how it works out, but we decided to, to have a go and just try a box set for the international market as well. So yeah, that's no. uh, what we're doing. I love it. I think it's a great, uh, great choice. Um, are you? Are there plans? We, we, you just mentioned a little bit about the map, and the map is a big, big part of it. And um, uh, in board, in the board game industry, it, these legacy, quote unquote, legacy type of games um, are really, really hot. But they're pretty much you play it once, and then it's it, it, you can't play it again. So it, yeah, that's that's okay, but. You know, a, a big complaint is that you can't uh, replay it and, and whatnot. Yeah. But with an RPG, you can always replay it, but you need new maps and new stickers. Is, is, are there plans to release maps and sticker packs, you know, once you release the box sets? Yeah, probably. I mean, that's that's. there's been quite a lot of discussion on this on, on the forums and on the Kickstarter mm -hmm. and some concern, which we are absolutely... Uh, looking into and, and taken into consideration but what we're i mean the first thing is that we'll at least have like the map is going to be double-sided so you can at least play it twice oh, okay. uh, and okay. then and then there will also be uh additional maps available if you want to sort of replay it even more times but so there will be definitely ways to, to replay the game or the campaign if you want to but i think sure. that the reason we're doing this and we think it's a nice idea is that I've always loved uh, making like chronic chronicles of, of campaigns to sort of, I mean, I've been doing things like mm -hmm. uh, writing down, I've been basically writing like books, just describing the campaign. And that's a lot of fun, but we felt that for this game, it would be so cool if we could give like tools to game masters and groups to sort of create their own chronicle of their campaign, but to actually not just give them to give some like more tangible tools to do that sure. and this kind of thing with the stickers on the map is like just one one way there's going to be some more stuff in the game to ha to do this but the map will actually be like a record of your campaign because it's going to have stuff on there that will make it into your map that is unique for your campaign so it's just going to be the same map that everybody else has but it's actually going to be a, a specific map for you and your group and it will not be uh the same as anyone else's so that's yes in a way you will be sort of changing the map permanently uh but it's also going to be a permanent record of your campaign you can put it on the wall or just I save it. it somewhere and you'll just have that if, like years after you finish that campaign and it's still and you can sort of you have that so that's sort of the idea behind it i love it i love it and that's exactly where i was gonna say i was gonna say you know it would be awesome is if you could frame it and then put it in your gaming room and then you could always talk yeah. about it you know years later on down the road and yeah uh, so it's gonna be like locations and also like you you're probably gonna have like i don't know if if characters die or something it's probably gonna be a little mm -hmm. like a tombstone or something you say, oh, i remember i died there that character you know he met his fate there and you know stuff like that i love that you know because uh, the biggest, the biggest, we have uh, this, the same store that uh, that I just referenced earlier that does Tales from the Loop. They have this big gaming room and they have a dry erase board, and they actually have like a gravestones and like this map drawn out for their RPG campaign, not for Tales from the Loop, but for other you know other RPGs. And they do that only it's you know they have a grave site for their dead mm -hmm. RPG players, and like they yeah. they talk about it and everything, and it's it's so great. So it's it's just like bringing that to your your own game room which is yeah, yeah. It's, it's genius it's genius i love it <laughs> thanks um so let's talk uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the game mechanically a little bit um in basically you choose attributes and skills you, you have a, a dice pool of d6s which is you know the standard format with uh, all the other games um, I love how the game in the other games, you know, character creation is really, really quick. Um, it's really simple. Uh, I've played Mutant Year Zero with my daughter. She's 11 and she loves it. And, you know, it was really easy to walk her through how to do it. it took like 10 minutes. Um, is it the same, pretty much the same way with uh, Forbidden Lands? 
Yeah, I mean the basic setup is is similar. It's and it's it's uh, if compared to the previous games, I would say it's more close to Mutant Year Zero than the others. But sure. but but there are some elements from from all of them. Uh, what we're adding, or at least as an option, uh, if actually if we reach the next stretch goal, that is because it's actually a stretch goal. Uh, what we'll be having is uh, is sort of a booklet that we call a legend and character generation uh, generator booklet, and that. What that will be do if you want to, we are adding a system to create characters where you sort of go through using some some choices and some random roles to sort of create a character uh, face by face or year by year almost. To sort of to, okay. and that's a way to, that will actually let you sort of learn the setting while you create your character. And that will obviously take a little bit more time than the, the quick way you do it in, in, in Mutant Year Zero. And, and the standard way of Forbidden Lands to create a character, you can still do it the quick way. Uh, but this is just going to be another option to, if you want to, you can sort of uh, create your character's background uh, step by step and, and create it, give it skill points and so on uh, as you go along. So that's going to be a, an uh, alternate way of creating your character. Nice, nice. Oh, I, yeah. I like that. Sounds, uh, sounds great. Um, and then instead of an arc or a ship, you have a stronghold. And that's... Yep. And, you know, that's yeah, that's the that's idea. I mean, yeah, it's it's similar. It's not it's not exactly the same. And the difference between like the arc in Mutant Year Zero because uh, is and the stronghold is that in, in Mutant Year Zero, the arc is where you start the game. It's like the right. base is where it, it all starts. It's not going to be quite like that in Forbidden Lands because we want to focus more on the traveling and the adventuring. So basically the stronghold is something you create when you want to. It's not something that's given oh, okay. from the start. It's actually something you build uh, you build at the time of your choosing. And the idea is that you can actually take, um, if you, I don't know, conquer uh, a castle from some someone or a dungeon or something where you go there and you sort of you, you clear it out from from evil forces or, or 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 whatever. You can actually say that. All right, this this castle was not too bad. Why don't we just sort of stay here and build a base out of it? And you can sort of take that location and turn it into your own castle, your own dungeon, uh, and build it okay. from there. So basically, you will be the idea is you won't you won't start out with a stronghold, but you'll you'll Build one or create one uh, later on during play when whenever you feel you want to. Okay, no, it's like a bit that. different, but there are some similarities too. Sure, sure. Um, let's see what. Of course, I, I made notes, so anybody uh, that's watching, I, I do prepare for these things. Um, let's. The one thing that I really like about um, uh, Mutant Year Zero is that uh, it's pretty much, if you're GMing a game, it doesn't take a whole lot of prep. Like you, you could just kind of just sit down and kind of play as you go along. And it seems like Forbidden Lands is, is a lot like that. And the players don't need to know a whole lot about lore. It doesn't need to, you know, GM kind of has a little bit of prep, but you don't have to really just kind of dive right in. Is that that's kind of the same? Kind of the same thing with uh, with this Forbidden Lands, as far as uh, that's concerned. Yeah, I mean that's that's the basic philosophy here as well. That we don't want to front load the game with a lot of lore. I mean there is more lore in Forbidden Lands than in Mutant Year Zero. I mean Mutant Year Zero is basically our world gone to hell, and then you sort of place the mutants in it. There is some backstory there as well. Right. Uh, but 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 in Forbidden Lands, there is a deeper history of this land. And, and but that what we really wanted to avoid is that you sort of feel that okay, I have to sort of I have to learn this world before I can play in it, because that creates a, sort of an obstacle to get into it. So we instead we have built the setting in a way that. The characters they will know the basics of the world, but not that much because of something. Yeah, for for reasons in in the history of the setting that they will have come from quite isolated villages and they won't know that much about what's actually going on. And the idea is that we have a system of something we call legends, and they're basically short snippets, short snippets of of history or lore that you get as handouts during while playing so basically when you there is going to be legends about like locations powerful uh, beings even artifacts items they will all each have a little bit of a legend and these legends are going to be in the form of handouts so that basically means that the characters can start off adventuring 
with very little they don't really need to sort of learn the lore before they go but they will sort of pick it up as they go along in these kind and then that will uh, uh, during play uh, you will sort of build up uh, your knowledge about the world and you will actually realize, oh, this is connected to that. Okay, I get it. And then sort of, it will all sort of co start to come together. But you will never have to sort of learn it before playing. You will learn it during playing. As you're playing. No, that's great. I love that. I love that, how it just kind of like all pieces together as you're, as you're playing along. Yeah. Um, so let's... Well, so so that that's kind of the mechanics of... of, of of Forbidden Lands, um, you've got a ton of funding for for this game. You've unlocked so many stretch goals. Um, you've got uh, you've upgraded uh, the book to hardcovers. We've got dice. We've got uh, cards. Um, we've got. I'm trying to think of what else you guys have unlocked uh, just in the campaign. A whole bunch of a uh, whole bunch of different things. Um, yeah. Most of the most of the stretch goals though are uh, adventure sites. Now, are those yeah. kind of like zone compendiums? Is that kind of how it works? With like, how would you how would you describe those? Yeah, an adventure site is, is a, a format that we're working with for Forbidden Lands. It's quite similar to a zo special zone sector. Uh, zone they're sector, called yeah. in Mutant Year Zero. It's sort right. of a it's a location uh, that sort of it's not a set. Uh, narrative. It's more of a location with with NPCs, with intrigue, background, and things that can happen. You can sort of approach it from a number of different uh, angles uh, as player characters. And the idea is the way that it will work, and that's a bit different from Year Zero, is that the big map is going to have like a lot of these uh, symbols of three different uh, categories. It's going to be village, castle, and dungeon. Okay. And basically, you'll know that, okay, so there is a village over there. We're not sure what it is, what village it is. It's just going to be a village symbol. And as you move close to it or even go there, the GM will basically choose, okay, uh, it's going to be a, have a number of adventure sites uh, that map to these categories. So there's going to be village adventure sites, castle adventure sites, and, and dungeon adventure sites. So basically, right. the GM can say, okay, so they're moving to this village. Uh, I could probably use this adventure site and, and just place it there. And okay. then then you have your location. So that what that means is that you don't need to lead the players to go to the place you want them to as a GM. Basically, you can instead place the interesting locations wherever the players are going or decide to go. Mm, okay. uh, so that's sort of the idea behind those. And and uh, the adventure sites themselves, they sort of have a backstory as well, and they sort of are connected to each other in some different ways. So by playing through them, you will also sort of learn the bigger picture and what's going on behind the, the scenes. Uh, but they also work as sort of standalone cool places to visit. And that's sure. what we've been adding as, as stretch goals is, is a lot of those adventure sites, basically, that were sort of uh, flesh out the world. You can sort of. There's also going to be a system in the game to generate randomly an adventure site. If they go to a oh, village, okay. you can, as a GM, just there's going to be tools to generate that village through some random tables. Uh, but these more fleshed out adventure sites are going to be sort of with a bit more depth and background. Nice. So uh, we have, and we have, that's really cool. I mean, Eric Grandstrom is going to be writing quite a few of these, but we also have right. some very cool guest writers from some from the OSR world uh, in the US who are going to be doing some of these things. Do you so want that's to, really cool. You want to give any of those uh, authors a, a mention, or yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's, let's uh, give them a little uh, bit. Yeah, we have uh, actually. I think they're all unlocked now, all three of them. So there's going to be one by Patrick Stewart, one by Ben Milton, and one by Chris McDowell. And these are all uh, uh, writers in the OSR scene that have been really been uh, doing some really cool stuff recently. So we're really excited to be able to work with them for this project. We haven't worked with them before, so this is sort of a, a new oh, nice. thing. But so this, we just reached out to them during the campaign, and they all uh, went for it. So that I'm re we're really excited about where that's going to end up. Absolutely. So that's uh, really cool. Yeah. Very nice. So, and it's quite nice because the adventure side format is it's quite modular because some of them are going to be connected more to this history of the setting, whereas some others are going to be quite standalone. It, it works. They're quite. And, and, and I would uh, suspect that these uh, adventure sites by external writers are going to be a bit more standalone in their format, but it also sure. gives them quite a lot of freedom to sort of create something that, that, uh, that they sort of unique for them and their style. Oh, that's great. I love it. I love yeah. it. 
<laughs> All right, so let's uh, let's talk a little bit about. Um, Okay, one one question that got brought up, and and I I read I kind of took this camp this this question from your forums that you have on your uh, free league uh, forums, and if anybody's a <laughs> fan of your of your games, I'm going to tell you to go to the forums because the forums are such a great resource for getting it, questions answered. I know you're on there quite a bit, um, yeah. and it's just it's just great. You've you've got a a great community of players. There's a, there's a Facebook page of Mutant Year. There's a Mutant Year Zero Facebook group. There's uh, a G Plus uh, Mutant Year Zero group. There's and I'm sure there's others as well. But especially check out your your forums because uh, you do a great job. And there's a whole lot of chatter on there for all your games. Um, some, yeah. someone someone um, brought up a question, and I thought it was great. How with Mutant Year Zero? It's a lot more. I don't want to call it brutal, or it's it's more. Uh, it, it, I guess yeah. I guess brutal is the, the the term I would use. It's a lot more brutal than Coriolis and Tales from the Loop. Like you have, yeah. you're almost always at risk of dying the whole game. How? What kind of degree is is Forbidden Lands on that spectrum between that and uh, and Tales from the Loop. Because Tales from the Loop, you can't die your kid. You don't want to see kids, you know, you don't want to role play that in any way, shape, yeah. or form. So uh, it's kind of interesting. Where, where does where does Forbidden Lands uh, kind of yeah. fall in between that spectrum? I would say probably compared to the other three games, Forbidden Lands is closer to Year Zero. There, it's okay. not identical, but it, it's more toward that side because it's we, we do call it kind of a survival fantasy game or post-apocalyptic fantasy. So it's it will have that kind of feel. Maybe not quite as brutal. There are some differences to Mutant Year Zero, but it's definitely closer to that. To that side. So yep. it's, uh, and, but what we're trying to do is, especially when it comes to like things like the combat system and so on, that it's the combat is quite short and brutal, um, but it won't necessarily kill you. It might take you out of action, but there are, and that's sort of the way we, and it's actually kind of the same in Mutant Year Zero that it's uh, combat is quite brutal, quite short, and you there is quite a high risk of getting taken out quite quickly. And that, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. there is mo most of the time, at least, a chance for someone to save you. If you have friends around, you can sort of survive the conflict and live to fight another day. And that's sort of the way we approach it this time as well. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Um, now, one thing that uh, that's different with with Forbidden Lands that uh, none of the other games are uh, the other ones were just purely D six based. This is the first game that uh, doesn't uh, it has other dice in it. What uh, I, I know you've kind of alluded you, you've kind of mentioned this on some of the updates. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about how these other foreign dice that nobody seems to know what to do with your your projects uh, are going to do in this in this uh, this game. Yeah, I mean. It's I don't know it's 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 part function part fun or just form I guess it's I mean the, I think the, what started is that we felt that for a fantasy game to get the feel that we wanted we just felt that we wanted the the polyhedral dice in there uh, just for the yeah. feel of it just because it sort of makes we just it felt it would be the right thing for the for the for the for the setting basically and then we started thinking okay so how would we actually use those because we said if we can't find some reasonable use for them we we're not going to put them in just because of it we, we, they have to sort of make sense and work in right. the system so this the and and we came up with something that we think works uh, and that basically we, they will be limited to to like powerful artifacts, magical items that are not just your average gear. It's something special, something magical, and that's also when you'll bring out the the magic dice, basically the, <laughs> the 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 special dice. And that's that's how they will. So you won't use them all the time. You will use them for specific items that are, and that they're also in the system. The work, the way they work is that they will be quite powerful. Adding a a, a d8 or d10 or even a d12 that's going to add a lot of power to your roll compared to just rolling the d6. So they will. It will be the feeling and the effect of, of rolling those or adding those to your dice pool is going to be quite powerful when you do that. Nice. No, I, I liked yeah. it. As soon as I saw, as soon as I saw, you know, I it took me by, by surprise because uh, you know when I when I looked at the Kickstarter, I'm like, oh my gosh, you guys have other dice in here. What's what's going on? This isn't a free <laughs> yeah. project. Um, yeah. And uh, then then it kind of made sense. That, yeah, if you're doing a, a fantasy RPG, that's kind of what people kind of expect. And so yeah. you, you know, I think that that was a that was a good move. And and I like how it's going to kind of hopefully make these these weapons a little more lethal in yeah. in this setting. 
which yeah. is which is great. Um, now there's already you've you've unlocked the, the we've got the the two main books the that that are part of the the game. Um, for anybody that that pledges for an o ogre pledge or higher, they also get uh, a campaign book, which is the Ravens the Ravens Purge. Um, that's written by Eric, if I remember yeah. correctly. Um, do we can can we talk about that a little bit? You want to talk? Sure. To, uh, mention that a little bit. Yeah, uh, I mean the the Ravens Purge book is going to be. I mean, there's uh, the base game is going to have like the the history of the setting, and, and it's going to be a, have a few. I think uh, three adventure sites are going to be included, and so on. So you will have enough to play just with the base game. Okay. But the Ravens Purge book is really going to be is, is if you want to play. Uh, really dig into this setting and this this lore. That's what you want to be playing because that will actually there is going to be. I mean, there is the the campaign. It's not a linear campaign. It's but the way we build it is, uh, it's going to have uh, a backstory. It's going to have main players with agendas. There's going to be like a possible final end battle or a, at least campaign finale nice. and then there's going to be these uh, adventure sites which are sort of interconnected but you can also play them in any order you like okay and then the, the idea is it's quite it's uh it's um i mean uh, the idea is that you will be uh hunting for it it's just going to be four artifacts that's kind of a you know it, it's 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 a classic theme right you want to be chasing mm -hmm. these number of artifacts but the idea is the way that works is that it's it you can as a gm you can place these artifacts that you'll be hunting uh really kind of anywhere you want or at least you, it's there's a lot of options there where to actually put them you can also control how quickly the players find these items depending on how fast you want to go through the campaign and, okay. by, and and when you have collected all four, that's when you can sort of unlock the end game. So that, that gives you a lot of control as a group and as a GM on how long you want to make the campaign and how quickly you want the players to actually reach the uh, the end goal. So it's um, that's the way it's it's built uh, it's built up. And the idea that we place this in a separate book is that we want Forbidden Lands. I mean, obviously, the idea is that this will be an awesome campaign and people will should you know want to play it but you can also use forbidden lands if you want to play just use the system and the rules and the the general approach to play in other worlds as well so that's why nice. we, we we separated out the raven's perch because that's if you want to really dig into the campaign and the lore but if you want to play in another world another setting you can just take the base game and not play the raven's perch so we want to give those options yeah, no, I think that's a great move. That's great. It's 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 yeah, very very smart move to do. Um, one of the and speaking of using it in different settings and, and whatnot, um, one of the stretch goals for this campaign was an open game license. Yeah. And so folks can create their own content. And you want to talk? A, I know you've kind of addressed it a little bit in one of the in one of the updates. But once it was hit, you want to talk a little bit about what that's going to do, what that's going to achieve for for folks, or what the, what that's going to allow the the community at large to be able to do. Yeah, I mean, the, this is actually something that's been brought up a couple of times. We didn't come up with it ourselves to start with. Uh, that okay. we got approached by by, and we we got asked that since we'd be using pretty much the same core uh, rule system. Should we want? Do we want to make a license out of it? Do we want to make it available to the community to make their own things? And we were sort of just toying around with the idea, and then we said, "Yeah, this is a good thing. We should really go ahead and do this." And then, and and we decided to make it into a stretch goal and to be able to actually put some work into making a nice, like a proper. It's going to be a PDF, but it's going to be a document that's sort of a, a core rules document, basically. That sort of. Uh, that was going to be easy to use if you want to to create your own game based on the same kind of rule set. Okay. Um, so that's that's the actual thing that that stretch goal means is that we'll be producing this and make it available to to everyone. So basically, what it means is is that if you want to, you want to, if you want to create your own game and you want to make it, make it compatible with this rules engine, you can just sort of there's going to be like a small logo you can put on the back and say it's compatible with. With this engine and and based on that engine and you can sort of use that and 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 there's probably we're also going to make like if we want to make um 
like adventures and modules uh, that are compatible with Forbidden Lands or, or some of the other titles, that's also going to be possible. You can sort of stamp that on the back of the book that this is compatible with Forbidden Lands or whatever. And you can sort of do whatever you want with it. You can, you know, publish it, sell it, whatever you like. If uh, And it's, uh, yeah, and we'll be happy to sort of promote it and so on. It's going to be sure. completely sort of open to do that. No, that's, I think that's great. And that, that just kind of shows you how much you're, you love your community and the people that play your games, that the people that really get into it, that want to make content and want to kind of, you know, be a part of what you, you what you've established and yeah. how you're you're not resistant to that and you want to embrace that more than anything else. Absolutely, yeah. I think that's uh, that's very commendable. And, and uh, I, I, as soon as I saw that, I was like, wow, that's that's really really cool. I'm, I'm glad you guys are doing that. Thank you. Um, let's. Uh, well, it's, uh, there it doesn't look like there's any ch no no chatter. There's some some viewers, but no nobody's asking any questions. Uh, I'll I'll say if anybody has any questions, feel free to put it in the chat, and we'll we'll glad to we'll be able to answer any of them that uh, that you have. Um, sure. In the meantime, let's uh, let's talk about the pledge levels um, for yep. Forbidden Lands. Um, the cheapest, the least ex I shouldn't say the, ch the cheapest, the least expensive pledge that someone can can pledge um, and play. And I've got the prices for U.S. dollars, so I if you want to. Uh, you can you, the cheapest, the least expensive that someone can pledge is twenty five dollars, and they get the PDFs for the for the uh, basic the, the game the game books that come in the um, in the box set uh, themselves. Do do they get uh, a map PDF or is what what I, I don't yeah, know what, yeah, uh, what PDFs they they get included. Yeah, that's pretty much. I mean, it's everything. It's a map, and it's all the unlocked adventure sites. It's not the entire Raven's Perch book because there's going to be some parts in there that are not uh, included. But all the unlocked adventure sites, okay. and the base game, and the map, and and all of that is included. in, in this is the like the PDF pledge, basically. Right, right. And twenty five dollars. That's a, that's a great value for uh, for uh, just PDFs alone. That's uh, you're going to get a lot of a lot of content for that. So if anybody yeah, just hopefully it's going to feel worth it. I mean, it's it's going to be a lot of content in there for sure. Yeah, I think uh, if anybody's even curious at uh, picking the system up, that's that's a great uh, great entry point. Um, the highest, if somebody really wants to go crazy on this game, which they can, um, the highest pledge is about three hundred and seventy seven dollars US. Um, you're going to get a ton of stuff. In fact, you're also going to get uh, you're going to get the um, the limited edition Forbidden Lands uh, package. You also get an exclusive canvas print of the cover from of Simon's art for the cover, which is just great. And I wish I had you know that much money to kind of put towards this project, but unfortunately <laughs> I don't. Um, but uh, I I think that that's uh, Again, it's it's just a great uh, a great uh, pledge level. The ogre pledge is seems to be like kind of the quote unquote sweet spot, I think, which is a little over a hundred bucks. Uh, you get the basic game, you get the the, the you get the base uh, box game, you get the Ravens Purge, uh, you get cards, you get dice, you know, uh, you get the PDFs. I'm trying to think of what else there's there's uh, yeah. Um, I can't remember what else is uh, is in that pet pledge, but that's that seems to be the most popular, if I remember correctly. It's, I think it's about. Uh, I didn't check the rates exactly, but it's around. I think it's less than a hundred bucks. It's around it 80, eight or eighty-eight or something like that. But okay. yeah, and that's basically it's includes everything. Basically, everything that's unlocked physically. I mean, it's got the map, the cards, the the dice, the box set, the extra book, and and all of that. And uh, so basically, I mean, the dragon, the, the the big, the highest pledge that you mentioned is with the canvas uh, print and so on. That's really if you want to go, you want to go all in and also sure. get that limited uh, version of the box and that uh, canvas print that's going to be signed, signed by Simon and so on. So if you really want to go all in, that's that's the one. But um, yeah, I mean, hopefully, I mean, it's always it's always a balance trying to sort of design these these rewards. But we we really want to make all of them uh, feel like you're getting good value for for what you're paying it's just a matter of how deep in you want to go basically sure sure um okay so we do we do have a question from uh it's like uh Mat matthias svensson mm -hmm. uh can can thomas say something about the magic system for forbidden lands will it be free as in uh, i'm gonna butcher this word i know that uh it's s-v-a-v-e-l-v-i-n-t-r or yes, yes. more like mutations 
Right. It's that 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 game that that he's mentioning. It's actually the one that's based on on Eric Ramstrom's book. Oh, okay. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. yeah. So that's the one. Yeah. For that game, uh, we had a very free magic system. That sort of basically it had some different disciplines of magic, but within those disciplines, you could basically design spells the way you wanted to, as long as you could sort of just. You could imagine what you wanted to achieve, and then the, you, the GM would basically set a difficulty level, and then off you go. Uh, uh, whereas mutations in Mutant Year Zero are, are much more clearly defined exactly what effect they have. Mm -hmm. So uh, for this game, we'll be landing somewhere a little bit in between. I mean, there's, it's not going to be as free for me as, 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 uh, as that game that he mentions. It, there's going to be more clearly defined spells, but also we want, we don't want to them to feel too too defined too limiting so that's something we're working on right now to exactly see how we there's going to be s defined spells but there probably be some more room for how to actually use them uh that's going to be a bit broader than mutations in mutant year zero so that's basically it's not super uh, clear maybe but that's where we're going right now and the magic system is actually that one of the uh, the things we've been starting work on at the latest so we're okay. that's sort of the one that one part that's not as finished as some as some of the other uh parts of the game so we're hard at work on that right now okay excellent yeah how, how much i mean if you were to put a percentage on how much you've completed of, the, of forbidden lands how, how much would you say is is kind of uh your percentage of, of completion yeah i mean if if uh, when it comes to written text i would say oh, what's hard to say maybe yeah 60 70 percent something like that but then that text also needs to be edited and so right, on right. so there's even though we have the text it, it needs uh, obviously uh it needs to be worked on and rules need to be tested and they need to be iterated on and so there's a lot of work left but we feel we have a strong foundation and we have like we have uh so, you know most parts of the game have a clear shape right now and, and most of them are written it's just a matter of finishing the job basically nice okay yeah um one thing that i that i will say that i really appreciated you guys doing um with your previous games is that you've kind of you've kind of put like the alpha game out and let folks kind of review it and say hey yeah. you know you might want to change this or you might do that do you plan on doing that again with with forbidden lands or yeah. is that something that's the idea. I mean, we've been doing that for a couple of games, and it's we did it for Mechatron, and we did it for Tales from the Loop, and it's 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 a fantastic thing uh, to get that kind of feedback to actually have have people trying it out, right. um, and have a chance to react to that feedback and and make the game better. Uh, obviously, there is some work involved. So actually, I mean, you have to sort of produce that PDF and 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 collect right. all the feedback and actually go through it, evaluate it, because, I mean, feedback is always valuable, but you cannot take, you have to sort of decide what to actually uh, go with and what you have, just have to feel, say, sometimes you just have to say that, okay, fair point, but that's not the direction we're going. I mean, sometimes, sure, sure. so there is some work just to sort of going through everything, evaluating everything. So, but we feel it's really worth it. So we'll be definitely try to do that for Forbidden Lands as well. Um, there's always the matter of translation because we're the way we've been doing it now for Forbidden Lands is actually we're writing it uh, in um, Swedish and then having an, a proper professional translator translating it into uh, good native English. So right. that's uh, for the alpha, we'll probably need to do some kind of translation like a uh, uh, preliminary translation or something like that that might delay it a little bit. But we should have an alpha out by hopefully by Christmas or something like that. Oh, and wow, that that's should, soon. And, yeah, I hope so. I mean, that's the idea. And that's that, that alpha is going to have, uh, it's not going to have all the scenario material, but there should be, the rules should be there. There should be at least one or two adventure sites so you can really sort of try the game out. That's at least the idea. There might be some parts that are not fully done, but I mean, hopefully we should, by the end of the year, there should be an alpha uh, out around that time. Okay. Excellent, yep. excellent. Um, Matthias also s asked another question: How are the players supposed to kill a dragon using uh, using Mutineer Zero combat system? And also, will there be dragons? 
Yeah, there's kind of probably going to be a dragon in there or two. Nice. We actually discussed that like yesterday because yeah. there's a particular dragon that we yeah. So there, yeah, uh, they won't be that common though, but there will be there. Yeah, nice. I mean that's it's a nice point. I'm not exactly sure um, what uh, what he meant there, but what I would say is that, uh, and that's also a difference actually from Mutant Year Zero is that I would say. I'm happy with that game, but you can you always feel that there are some things you can do even better. I and mean, I think one of the points where Mutant Year Zero, the system, uh, it, it has a bit of a challenge is when it comes to finding like big monsters because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the way that system works uh, is that when you beat the when you beat down like their strength because the strength doubles up as hit points. That so basically means that when you inflict damage on a monster, it gets weaker and it it's not as uh, dangerous anymore, which right works for like human or human-like opponents but when it's a big monster that can be a little bit anticlimactic because that big monster is going to be get less dangerous during the fight mm -hmm. and we might want a situation where the monster actually gets more dangerous when it gets hurt so we have we're going to be working with a bit of a different system for forbidden lands that will make every monster more unpredictable and you will sort of it will not follow the normal rules in the same way. Probably we will have something like uh, a table of actions, maybe possibly a random table that is going to be unique for each monster. So there's going to be like signature attacks for these monsters that are not going to be dependent on the current strength level in the same way. So you will never feel, you won't be safe uh, in the way that you might possibly feel in, in year zero because of the way the system works. Nice. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, like I said, I, I love how you guys just kind of tweak tweak this system and make it make it its own thing. And and Forbidden yeah. Lands just has me so excited. I can't I can't wait to actually like sit down and just just read right through it. Very cool. Um, let's see here. Uh, <laughs> Matias says, "Don't hit the dragon. You only make him mad." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, great. Um. Yeah, I, I'm trying to think if there's any, if Matthias has any more questions, feel free to, to let us know. Um, but that's pretty much all of my notes that I had for uh, for Forbidden Lands and for this, this session. Oh, do you want, can we talk a little bit about uh, what Free League has plans for uh, 2018? Can we, can we kind of spoil a little bit? Can we? Sure, I mean, we I have, wanna, some, I yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously, for, right now, the last is the main focus and and uh oh you're you're breaking up a little bit of course yeah. you know as, as as soon as soon as i started asking you about uh, spoilers you, you, your your connection all of a sudden <laughs> becomes questionable to us i, I don't yeah. know that that's that seems very uh coincidental very convenient right yeah yeah, yeah. exactly yeah, yeah. Is, is it better now is this is it, it, okay? it is yeah it came back on yeah okay no, I mean, we do have some other projects that will be, I mean, there is uh, some things that I can talk about, some other things that I can't really talk about yet, but sure. things that I can talk about are, I mean, after Mechatron, we have the, uh, another mutant expansion, the, f the third one, like, like the fourth mutant book. And that's actually, uh, it's not the end of mutant, but it's like those four are really like the four pillars of mutants. So the last one is mutant Elysium, which is about the non-mutant humans that live in the underground enclaves. So it has a bit of a, almost like a cyberpunk feel to it because you it's this kind of underground city that you, you play in. So that's, that is uh, being translated right now and it's going to be coming out next year. We also have a, a sequel game to thing from um, to um, Tales from the Loop that's called Things yeah. from the Flood. So that's sort of a sister game to, to Tales from the Loop that's also coming out next year. And then there's a couple of things that I can't really sure, discuss sure. just no, yet. No, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, are you planning on having uh, things from the flood come out before Gen Con so you can sweep their their awards next year? Well, or maybe. No, maybe. <laughs> no, 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 I'm just kidding. I'm just yeah. kidding. Um, no, I, I'm I'm really excited about that. I, if, uh, I did a, a a piece on on our on our channel for uh, tales from tales from the loop, and every, hey, people have you know put comments in in the video, and and I said, yeah, you know, they've got another book coming out pretty you know next year that's gonna you know even add on to this so people are very very excited about uh, about that genre and that that game in particular but uh, you know I'm just uh, really really excited for you guys you guys just 
like I said, I can't uh, can't stress enough how how great you guys just put out great products. You put out you know great games. It's just so much. It's so much fun to watch you, and, and uh, just over these last couple of years, you guys just kind of exploded onto the scene, and it's it's great to great to see. Thank you. Uh, it's been it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Is this is this something that you've always wanted to do? I guess so. Yeah. I mean, I've been sort of writing games. Uh, like since I started playing games and that's like yeah a long long time ago, long time ago. So, yeah I mean, obviously this is uh, I mean doing it in this way and, and sort of being able to make games that that reach well basically around the world that's obviously a, a, a dream come true so yeah sure. it's it's fantastic sure well, that's great um, I'm, I'm very very excited for it um, where can folks uh, find you? If folks want to uh, to find you on, on social media or f find you online, where, where can folks find you? Well, uh, we have a website. It's just uh, freeleaguepublishing.com in, in, in one free league publishing in one word. And then there is always the Facebook page. I think you would have to, yeah, there we are. Uh, it's still under the Swedish name. So that's Fria League, and it means the same thing as Free League. It's just in in Swedish. So that's F R I A, and then L I G A N. But you can also find links to it just from from freeleaguepublishing.com. So you'll basically be able to find everything there. Nice, nice. Just uh, Forbidden Lands on Kickstarter. Just go to Kickstarter and search for Forbidden Lands, and you should find it right away. Now, are you going to have a? Uh, are you going to? If folks are watching this and, and the Kickstarter has ended, are you going to have late pledges available for uh, for folks? I know you did with uh, Simon's last book a little bit. Is the same same kind of thing going to go for for the yeah. Yes, so that's the idea. We'll we'll most likely use a pledge manager for that for for upgrades and late pledges and managing addresses and all of that. So that's so sure we'll have that. It's always I mean it's always nice to if if you have the opportunity to pledge during the Kickstarter. That's always yeah. better because that helps unlocking stretch goals and it sort of keeps everything in together. But sure, yes, there will uh, be a, there will be a pledge manager and there will be uh, opportunities to to make late pledges uh, in, in the pledge manager uh, later as well. Excellent, excellent. And folks can follow you on Twitter. You got uh, you got a Twitter handle. I know that uh, we've yep. tweeted at you a couple times. And Absolutely. So, uh, so you can find us there as well. Uh, just, yeah, it's, you should pro if you just search for Free League, uh, you should be able to find it. If anybody's uh, interested in following them, I'll put all their links down, down in the description of this video too. Um, but yeah. So I guess that's that's all that's gonna do it for me. I, I want to thank you for coming on, staying up late. I know there it's like after eleven o'clock at night, which is yep. way later than uh, where you know I, I, I'm I'm usually up to one or two in the morning just doing scoop, you know, doing yeah. stuff for the channel. But uh, it's usually a lot later, and everybody's tired, and I know everybody has stuff in their personal life that they that are that they've got going on. So uh, I appreciate you taking time out of your 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 you know, your personal life to come on the channel and, and talk a little bit about Forbidden Lands and, and about Free League. And sure. I, I wish you guys all the a ton of success for, for Forbidden Lands and for every project you got going forward because, like I said, I'm a huge fan and, and uh, I can't wait to see what uh, 2018 is going to bring for you guys. Fantastic. Thank you so much. No problem. All right, folks, that's going to do it for me. Uh, Matthias, thank you so much for... Uh, asking some questions and, and joining us and, and the, the viewers that we've had uh, join us as well. Um, if anybody is uh, interested in Forbidden Lands, check out the Kickstarter. You've got a few few days left and uh, we can hopefully unlock a few more stretch goals and help them make this a really, really cool project. Maybe, hopefully, maybe even their biggest Kickstarter to date. So, all right, that's going to do it for me. My name is Doug. This has been Victory Condition Gaming because winning shouldn't be the only Victory Condition when you get to the table. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you on the next video.